Good morning, everyone. I'm Emily Levitan, and I'm an associate professor of epidemiology, and I feel like I'm a little loud, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> I'm also, I help to coordinate this lecture series, seminar series, the Friday Fellows meetings, and um, if any of you are taking this class for credit, I'm also the instructor for that class. Um, I'm going to be talking about Epidemiology Study Design 101. It, this is um, from the epidemiology perspective, the epidemiology framework, because I am, that's what my training and background is in. But this is really uh, pretty generalizable to any sort of um, science where you're doing observational studies. Um, so economics, sociology, other, uh, study, other fields use these same sorts of study designs, these same sorts of ideas that ones that are doing um, quantitative research. However, um, sometimes the words or the, the way that things are conceptualized are a little bit different. But, but generally, this is, this is not strictly epidemiology. I will say this is a hard lecture for me to put together. Um, it's a hard thing for me to talk about, because this is what I do. You know, I've spent the last 16 years just doing epidemiology. So I'm going to try and give you just a taste of, of what epidemiologists do and how you can use this and how you can use epidemiologic techniques or other observational techniques in your research. But um, it's, it's really a little bit surface. Um, also, please stop me if you have any questions while we're, while we're talking. Um, so first of all, we're going to be talking about correlation and causation, then developing a testable hypothesis, designing an epidemiologic study, and epidemiology resources at the end. So for the designing an epidemiology study, um, I would ask that you start thinking about a study that you might want to do, as a question that you might have that where an epidemiologic or observational study might be helpful, because I'm going to ask for a volunteer for that part. So to start with, you hear a lot um, in the media and other places, correlation does not equal causation. So why not? What, what sort of goes wrong when you can't just see like one thing happens and another and the number of time periods in the world is correlated to the uh, to the pollution in the world. So okay. It's not causation, it's correlation. And what what might explain that? Because there's something that uh, happened and happened at the same time that is totally Right, so you can have things that are happening at the same time, or things that ha maybe have common causes, um, and uh, there, there you might see correlation with, without causation. And when we think about this in a scientific context, we think of that as being a bias of some sort. You know, sometimes it's just chance, occasionally it's just chance, a lot of times there's something else going on, right? Because um, people are not, you know, uh, cell cultures or lab rats, you know, you have a lot of, the, like, it's not like you can just change one thing for a person, or, or people who are different in one way are not different in just that one way. There's sort of patterns that go together. So we have a bunch of different types of bias that we talk about as epidemiologists. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about two of them, confounding and selection bias. But there's others. There's measurement error and other things that can happen and that can go wrong that can mean that correlation does not equal causation and that require some design and analysis techniques to try and get at causation. Right? So if you're a good epidemiologist, you get taught to almost never talk about cause and effect. But what we really care about is cause and effect. So confounding happens when people who are exposed are different than those who are not. Or another way of saying this is that the risk is different in the exposed and the unexposed populations in ways that aren't actually related to your exposure. So say that we're looking at the association between race, ethnicity, and obesity. Um, and we want to know, is race, ethnicity associated with, or you know, um, a cause of obesity? One of the things that happens in the US is that um, First of all, age is related to obesity. Second of all, the population distributions, the age distributions of the populations are different for different ethnic groups in the US. Right? So what you're going to see is that if you just sort of look at it 
crudely, some of the proportion of the some proportion of the association between age, ethnicity, race, ethnicity, and obesity is actually due to age and not to the sort of construct of race ethnicity that you're trying to look at. So our solution is that we control for age, right? So we've got a bunch of different ways of trying to do this, right? And age is something that we can measure pretty well. We can, this is something that will happen. So if you see those um, NHANES um, articles that come out every couple of years or the BRFSS articles, there's one every maybe three or four years that comes out about the relationship between race, race, ethnicity, and obesity. And all of them have adjusted for age or controlled for age in some way to take it into account the fact that the, popu that the age distributions of different race ethnic groups in the US are, are not the same. Now, say that we want to look at the association between fruit consumption and obesity. Now, fruit consumption is related to a bunch of other healthy behaviors. Right? So people who are, want to be healthy tend to eat more fruits and vegetables. The problem is, unlike age, where we have a pretty good idea of how to, how to measure that, measuring this like propensity to be healthy is a challenging thing to do. So we can get at sort of proxies for this. We can look at physical activity. We can look at consumption of other you know, things that are healthy or other you know, ways of trying to get some proxy of, of propensity to be healthy. Um, but they're not perfect, right? So we're, this, is, this is one where we're still a little nervous. So you know, in claims data, that I, I do a lot of work with where you're looking at just insurance records, um, you might look at something like is someone getting a mammogram, right? Because that's sort of a health-seeking behavior people are more likely to be concerned about or interested in their health. But clearly that's not, that doesn't fully capture this idea of propensity to be healthy. Right, so ha measuring, some of these things are difficult to measure. Now, not everything that I can draw with this kind of diagram is actually a confounder. Um, so if we wanted to know about the relationship between obesity and myocardial infarction, and we have this variable diabetes, right? So we know that obesity causes diabetes, and diabetes is, causes MI, right? So diabetes is actually part of the causal pathway for the association between obesity and myocardial infarction, right? So we don't want to adjust You'll sometimes, you know, see people say, oh, you know, anything that you adjust, anything that changes the estimate by 15% or more. Adjusting for diabetes is going to change your estimate by 15% or more. But it's not because it's a confounder, it's because it's on the causal pathway, right? So you might, so sometimes you might want to adjust for diabetes if you want to say how much of that association is mediated um, by diabetes, but it's not, it's not the same thing as confounding. Does that make sense? Great. So, you know, confounding is one major bias we think about. Selection bias is another one. Um, and so selection bias happens when the exposure is related to how you get into the study or whether you can see people in the study, we can see the events. So it used to be that the example that was always used was case control studies, right? So you, you have people who have your disease of interest, you have people who don't, and if the way that those people get into your study is different, or the proportion of people who say yes, or the kinds of people who say yes if they're a case versus a control is different, that can lead to selection bias. But I think now, particularly when we're thinking about doing research with electronic medical records, Thinking about differential loss to follow-up is actually maybe a more informative example. So here's the example I came up with yesterday. Um, so poke holes in it if you want, um, because I, you know I, I think this is this is a, a concern that I have. So if we wanted to know is rural residents associated with cardiovascular disease among patients with cancer. Um, so if we say, okay, we're going to pick as our study population people who sought their initial cancer care at UAB, right? And then we're going to follow them up through their medical records. So here's, here's sort of my diagram. These diagrams actually have a whole math behind them, so if you're ever interested, I can, I can give you. And so there's, these are actually markup models, um, so you can put them all in as, as conditional probabilities. But I think they're also helpful for just sort of looking at what's, what's going on here. 
So if you think about how people wind up in cancer care at UAB, right? So if someone gets diagnosed with cancer, even if it's a fairly aggressive cancer, they have a little bit of time, right? So you're, you're probably not going to need treatment in the first day. You can probably go for like a week, right? So somebody who is maybe lives in Jasper, you know, maybe 40 miles from here, they might get diagnosed in Jasper and then think about, okay, what are my options? And very likely, if they can, they're going to come to UAB, right? Because we're just a much bigger center, we have much bigger volume, you know, and comprehensive cancer center, right? So you get people who are coming from all over the state and, and probably out of state as well to UAB for cancer care. Okay, so that's our, that's our study population. And then we're saying, okay, is rural residents associated with having heart disease or stroke? Now, is heart disease or stroke, is that the same sort of, do we, does UAB have the same um, patient population for their heart disease and stroke cases and their cancer cases? I mean, I would say no, but I mean, in the sense that it's a hub for people from all over the state and out of the state, is same similar. So it is a hub, but if you're talking about, okay, I'm having a heart attack now, or I'm having a stroke now, do you go from Jasper to here? Oh. Right? No. <laughs> right? So, you, you know, for in those cases, right, those treatments, you want to get into the hospital in treatment as fast as humanly possible. Right? So, you know, you're talking 30 minutes an hour, right? Beyond that, like they, um, you'll hear people say, like, time is brain or time is, is muscle, right? That people, that you need this treatment right away. Right? So you're going to get some subset of people who are going to be where we're, you know, we're just not going to see the, the, those heart attacks and strokes that are treated at other places in our EHR, right? So they're just kind of, they're there. I don't know if you can see that I've kind of grayed these out. And that's going to be related to your rural, whether or not you're in rural residents, right? So where you live is not this, you know, it's, so you've got one way of where you live being related to whether or not we see you for cancer care. And that's not the same association for where they receive you for heart, for heart attacks and strokes. And so this can lead to biases as well. Right? So I think that this is one that we are, as a, as a field, really struggling with. We don't have a good, <laughs> a good sense of, you know, like, how do, we, how do we do this with EHR data? So EHR data is clearly really powerful. But if you're missing a lot of your events and it's related to your exposures, this is going to cause a major bias. There are systems that, where this doesn't happen. So, you know, like the Kaiser systems, they, even if you're treated at a different hospital, they know and they will, you know, you'll pick up those cases. Um, UAB, that's not the case. You know, even in Birmingham, you know, if you're treated at St. Vincent's, we don't know that. So it's a, it's a challenge. We're still trying to figure out exactly how this is going to work, what the best practices are. Okay, so, you know, we have um, statistical methods that deal with confounding. Um, some of them are as simple as stratifying, right? So we just look at, you know, men and women separately, or we look at within age strata. Um, and, you know, those, those can help to deal with confounding when we can actually measure our confounding. For selection bias, we, there are some cases where you can use the statistics to... Uh, address this, but mostly it's a design issue. Um, and those are, you know, sort of uh, beyond the topic for today, but there's certainly a lot that you can, you know, if you're interested, the biostats and epi classes in the School of Public Health are some of the, you know, you can learn some of these tools. Okay, next topic is developing a testable hypothesis. So for my postdoc, I was looking at diet affecting heart failure. Okay, that's, that's a question. It's a big question, right? That's not a, that's not a postdoc's worth of question. Um, and it's certainly not a paper's worth of question. So here, you know, we're talking about a testable hypothesis. If you went to uh, Mike Magavero's talk um, several weeks ago, you know, you're thinking about what's your research question. Here we're really, um, you know, I think that this is complementary in that we're really thinking about you know, okay, so here's a paper-sized chunk for a research question as opposed to, you know, um, a, a larger 
body of research, which I think he was talking about sort of more of a pathway or a program of research. And so these are, you know, it's helpful to think about both. So, you know, to get a little more specific here, we can think about what aspects of diet. We're looking at specific foods and nutrients. Are we looking at diet patterns, deficiencies, overload? Affect how, right? So are we talking about preventing heart failure? Are we talking about slowing the progression? Um, reducing mortality in people with, who already have heart failure? Reducing symptoms, right? So all of these things are questions that you have to ask. And then also thinking about in who, right? So you're talking about older people, women, people with diabetes, mice, you know, there's different ways of thinking about this. Um, so now there's actually a good bit in the literature about, um, you know, about this topic. When I was first doing my literature review to write my T32 on this, or my F32 on this topic, uh, most of what I could find was actually in Great Danes, who apparently have a lot of diet-induced heart failure. Um, but, you know, I think that um, now, there's, now there's a lot more people. So if we think about what makes for a good research question, and remember this is like, again, a paper-sized chunk of a research question. There are two um, sort of approaches that um, have these acronyms, the finer criteria for thinking about what your idea is, and then the framing um, is called the PICO approach. Um, these are just two, but I think they're kind of useful. So finer stands for feasible, interesting, novel, ethical, and relevant. So are any of these things absolutes? No, right? So these are, you know, it's always a, it's, there, it's a balance, right? So what's feasible for me might not be feasible for you. And, you know, there are people in this university who can pull off um, cre creating and maintaining a cohort of 30,000 people for 15 years, which you know, I don't have the logistic skills to be able to do that. Right? So I think that you know, where you are and the skills that you have, the resources that you have, really play into whether or not something is feasible. What about interesting? Anybody have a, the experience of working on a paper and being really excited about it and having the reviewers be like, why are you doing this? <laughs> right? So, you know, I would certainly not recommend that anybody go and say, okay, I think this is a really boring project, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? That's, that's probably not a good approach. Um, that being said, you know, thinking about can you convince the people around you that this is exciting? That's probably a good test before you even start to embark on the project. And not only the people around you, sort of, you know, your research team, but if you have the opportunity, you know, people who are, can you convince other people, other, you know, people in this room, can you convince, you know, come to our Wednesday breakfast and, you know, convince other people from across the university that this is, this is a good project to work on? It's probably a good test. It's not a guarantee, right, because reviewers are sometimes going to look at it and be like, no, this, this is not good. Or not, it's not that it's not good, but sometimes they'll say this is just isn't, this just isn't worth the effort. Novel, right? So again, you don't want to do something that's already been done to death. But you know, none of us are coming up with something that no one has ever thought of before, right? It's it's a, usually a small tweak. You know, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. There's a lot of research that has come before us. There's a lot, it's you know a lot of people who are working in the same fields. So you certainly don't want to just do a repeat, but you know, you need to have, have a spin in terms of what it is that makes your project new and, and add, adding to the literature. Ethical, we certainly don't want to hurt people, right? We don't want to, that's not what we're in this field for. Um, and we don't want to be, you know, we don't want to violate any of these criteria. On the other hand, you know, it's a balance of risks and benefits, right? So. Most studies do, um, involve some degree of risk for the participants. For the, a lot of the stuff that I do, <coughs> the risk is you know, secondary data analysis, or we're doing you know, diet questionnaires, things like that. You know, the risk is pretty minimal. You know, we could lose their data, which would not be a good thing, but it's you know, not the worst thing in the world. For other, you know, for other areas, you, know, you might be doing an intervention where, you know, it, you could have a serious risk for adverse events, right? And so you need to be honest about that. But you know, how, 
But again, it's, you know, it's a judgment call. So there's a super interesting study, which I cannot believe got through the IRB. Um, so they took people that had a history of heart attack and they um, put them with a mask and the mask had um, diesel exhaust and they had them exercise and had ECGs, right? And so it's a fascinating study, right? And you can see how, how air pollution really affects um, you know, the, the heart function and ischemia. But I'm like, wow, I can't imagine. Was there any deception involved? Or was no, 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 <laughs> there's no deception, yeah. Okay, I'll give this to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, probably the, probably the reason that this was ethical was, you know, it's probably not too different than standing on the corner and having a, you know, a big truck come by. But still, you know, it's a little worrisome. Yeah. So, you know, I imagine that there's probably detailed discussions with the IRB about how exactly they were going to do this. And finally, relevant. Um, right? So you want to you have a, a topic that is going to matter. Right? So I had this idea that was like, this was actually the last couple months ago, where it was like this very complicated model, and it was going to show whether <laughs> Um, people, whether hospitals were responding to guidelines versus, you know, just sort of, so the guidelines have different guidelines for different ages, and so we're going to, like, talk about the guideline changes and when the guideline came out and all this stuff. And, you know, I was talking to one of the cardiologists who's a collaborator with me, and she's like, well, why do we care whether they respond to the guidelines? What we care about is what's happening now, right? So we scrapped my very fancy, exciting model, and um, went with the one that's actually more relevant for what's happening now and what might happen in the future. Questions about this? Okay, so that's sort of thinking about your idea. Um, PICO stands for Patient Population of Interest, Intervention or Issue of Interest. As an epidemiologist, I think of this as exposure, but then you don't get the nice acronym. Um, comparison, right? So who is your comparator group? What's your outcome and what's your time frame? So time frame is often the one where people are a little confused about. The other ones I think people are pretty happy with. So here's my silly example. So why, why do we need to talk about time? So is rabies associated with a higher risk of death? Yes, right? So. The, 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 like, the obvious answer is yes. The less obvious answer is it depends on when you ask, right? <laughs> so if you've got here um, this red line, right? So this is a, like a mock-up of a Kaplan-Meier curve, right? So you've got risk of death going from 0 to 1 or 100% on your y-axis, and then time on your x-axis, right? So your red line is people with rabies, right? So with people with rabies, yes, there's going to be a very um, sharp increase in the risk of death. And pretty much by a couple of months, everyone with rabies, like people don't generally survive rabies. On the other hand, without rabies, right? So risk of death is low, increases a little bit over time. And I, I changed this yesterday, but I, I should move my blue curve out a little bit. Um, but 100 years from now, how, what percentage of people with rabies are going to be dead? Yeah. Right, everybody. What percentage of this population 100 years from now, like in this room? Or, or, yeah, right. Practically, likely 100%, like all of us, will be dead 100 years from now. Right? So if you're thinking about the risk ratio at you know, three months, it's going to be you know, 100, right? So you talk about the and that's a lot of times in epidemiology how we talk about things. So we talk about the ratio and the risk and the exposed. So the, you know, that's going to be close to 100% for the rabies group, and it's going to be close to 0% for the, um, for the non-rabies group. Right? So you're going to get a huge relative risk. 100 years from now, your relative risk is going to be 1, which is the norm. Right? So, so this is something to keep in mind um, when, you're, when you're doing studies and thinking about what is the relevant time to ask. And you know, clearly this is a ridiculous extreme example, but you know, it, it, does, um, it is something to consider as you're looking at, um, as you're thinking about your studies. So here's, here's a slightly better research question. Right? So 
is intake of fatty fish associated with hospitalization for or death from heart failure among women? Right? So that's a little more specific. It's not quite specific enough. So what are we talking about fatty fish? So we're talking about self-reported consumption of herring, tuna, or sorry, salmon, herring, and mackerel. Um, and you know, from a food frequency questionnaire, you probably, if you were doing this in the US, you'd be looking at salmon and tuna. But this is Sweden, so people eat a lot of herring and mackerel. Um, nine years of follow-up, we have middle-aged and older women, and women living in two counties in central Sweden. And we're just really looking at you know, incident heart failure, so we're looking at um, first heart failure event only. Right? So this is sort of, you know, this now tells you like, who your population is. It doesn't really tell you the comparator because in epidemiology, a lot of times we've got more of a continuous rather than sort of a clinical trial where you'd have exposed and non-exposed. We've got people who eat a lot of fish, some people who eat some fish, some who eat no, no fish. Most of this population actually eats fatty fish once per week. So that was, that was a little bit of a challenge in terms of modeling this. So here's our results, right? So these are hazard ratios, similar to uh, relative risk. So one is the null, and never is our referent group, right? So there's no, we have that little dot, but not one, but no confidence interval, right? Because that's a referent group. And you can see that um, as fatty fish increases, you get a decrease in the risk of um, incident heart failure. You get, and then you've got this group at the end who's kind of maybe a bump up. Now, one thing you can see is that those confidence intervals are really wide. The reason they're really wide is because it's not a very big group. Um, so you don't really, and the wider your confidence intervals are, the less certain you are about what exactly, what the answer really is, right? So it's, there's some sort of noise in there. Um, the other thing is that in this population, so Sweden is, is interesting in a bunch of different ways. So I did my postdoc partially in Sweden. Um, one thing is that even among middle-aged and older women, you have a lot of binge drinking. And pickled herring is bar food. So you get, so you know, we tried to adjust for sodium. We tried to adjust for alcohol intake. But some group in that, like greater than three times per week, are probably people who are getting really big alcohol load and a really big sodium load along with their along with their hair, and we can't quite tease that apart. So probably some residual confounding there, plus a small group. Because like I said, the biggest group is really the ones per week. That's, it's a pretty homogenous population, and people's diets don't vary that much. OK. So who wants to volunteer to talk about a study that they've been thinking about? Anybody? Um. So uh, what about uh, trying to assess the effectiveness of a outreach program? Mm -hmm. So um, looking at uh, colorectal cancer in Alabama mm -hmm. and um, evaluating how effective it is like over time and then looking at race and gender and seeing how it impacts. Okay. So, um, what is your, so your exposure, what is your exposure? Well, I guess, well, it's, it's, it's more looking at collecting all the, well, I don't know, maybe there isn't a outreach program. <coughs> outreach program, would that be the intervention or exposure? Yeah, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. I haven't given it enough. I don't know. Oh no! I mean, so this is this is the sort of example. Like, so if someone was to come to me for, um, I'm also on the um, biostats, biostats Epi Research Design Core for the CCTS. So this is the sort of question that, mm -hmm. you know, the way I would talk through. Okay. So. So I'm looking at it from the sense of okay, you have a, a cancer incidence mm -hmm. in, in 2005, for example. Then you you um, give this. You start this outreach and then you track it. So I, I don't know. It's not like there was any, um, um, there isn't any exposure per se. I mean, there's cer a certain rate people get cancer. So, okay, so it sounds like colorectal cancer is your outcome, right? Right, right. Um, and, okay, so we've got our outcome. Um, and it sounds like what you want to know is what is the, what's the effect of this outreach intervention? Yeah. 
So what does that outreach intervention look like? Do you have? Um, I'm not sure about that. I don't, I don't have a lot of information about mm -hmm. it yet because I'm still kind of talking to the, um, the gentleman that, that runs the program. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't really comment too much on it. But it's just like, you know, PSAs and, you know, pamphlets. It's things like that. To, and is it like pr um, promoting um, colonoscopy? Colon right. Okay. So, okay. So you've got an intervention that starts around 2005-ish? Yeah. We'll say two, starts around 2005. And a number of preventative type things that they're doing because of this program. So that they go to the program and they do the preventative things and the, you're going to track those things and see how it relates to the outcome of um, well, see, that's the thing. It may, it may not even be a good mm -hmm. question. And, and oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's a totally, it's a good question, I think. But, it's um, a tricky question, but it's a good right, one. Right, because um, you get the education, and you may or may not get a colonoscopy or a, a, a flex sig or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, you don't necessarily do the, you may not necessarily do the treatment, you know, the, the you know what I'm saying? So, the, uh, the, um, I can't think of the word, but the uh, the treatment could only be the education. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The intervention. The intervention. Yeah. So your intervention, I think your intervention is this the rollout of this um, education, program. education program that's promoting colorectal cancer screening. Right. Okay. And your outcome is is the number of colorectal cancers. And, and mortality. And mortality. Okay. So you've got. Cancer mortality, colorectal cancer mortality, colorectal cancer um, incidence. It'd be nice if you also got screening, if you had some way of being able to tell. Like, are people taking that ne that next step, right? Because the mortality and the incidence are several steps down the road. Um, but if you can't, that's that's okay too. Um, okay, so that's your intervention. So, your pa who's your patient population? Well, it's really any any patient in Alabama. So it's basically Alabama. Right. Okay. So we've got you know, people in Alabama, and that's that's a broad one, right? And so here again, this is more clinical research focused. Um, so you know, this is this isn't really patients, right? This is just population of interest. Um, okay. So what's your comparator, right? So this is this is where this is the tricky question. So. My thought was, you could look at like there's um, this may not be the right database, but you could you could maybe go to the American Cancer Center and look at cancer um, incidence and mortality for the entire nation, and then you could compare it to Alabama, or you could maybe look at um, uh, states that expanded uh, Medicare. Um, Medicaid, and you can compare to that and see if that has you know any difference. Mm -hmm. Right. So thinking about your comparator here is is a challenge. Um, so you have a couple of different options. So the one that you suggested is is looking at places that didn't have this rollout around the same time. Right? Um, and from that, you know, there's sort of an econometrics design that I didn't actually talk about here, where it's the difference and differences approach. So you would say, okay, what's the What's the trajectory in Alabama with you know before and after this intervention rollout, and what's the trajectory somewhere else that didn't have the same intervention? Um, yeah, so your comparator is sort of a combination of the time, you know, the the time before the intervention and after the intervention, right? So you're comparing that, and you're also comparing for people in a different population who didn't get this intervention. Um, and so, you know, those are those are sort of get used for these sorts of policy or mass population type of interventions. Is that you get these sort of difference in differences approaches? Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, do do you think um, if 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 we say, oh well, look, you know, cancer incidence is going down, mortality is mm -hmm. going down, our program is effective. You can't really say that though necessarily because the cancer incidence mortality in the country may be going down too, right? I mean, would you? Would you? Right. So okay. So exactly. So that's where things get tricky, right? So that um, say we're just doing pre-post, mm -hmm. right? You say okay, um, 
you know, 2005, or like, you know, say you look like 2000, or like 94 to 2004, and then you look at, you know, 2006 to 2016, and that's your comparator group, right? Like you say, we could see a different a decline. Um, and it's not because of our intervention, it's just because everyone's going down, right? That there's other stuff that's happening. Um, and that's, that's definitely a problem, right? Where you have these sort of one-time mass changes, particularly for a fairly weak intervention, that probably this, you know, PSAs and pamphlets are probably not a very strong intervention. Um, and so, yeah, you've got some, you know, confounding by secular trends. If, on the other hand, you were able to, you know, go to Louisiana, say, and they didn't have the same sort of change, what the what Louisiana would, if you could get that data, what that would tell you is sort of you could subtract out those secular trends, and that would help you to be a little more confident that it's actually your intervention. You said subtract out the 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 not the subtract out what again? The the, the secular trend and oh, just okay. sort of declining mortality mm -hmm. in the population. Um, but it's a, it's a tricky, right? So trying to figure out um, what's the right comparator for these sorts of um, you know, policy change studies is, is not a simple thing. To, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to would do. It be, would it make sense to downsize the population of interest so you, you could have, you could find your comparative groups there, so maybe adjacent counties, um, you know, mm -hmm. rather than looking at statewide data that might, you know, make things easier for you? Um, to have that comparative group there, I don't know, because mm -hmm. similar counties, adjacent counties are going to have, you know, with similar dem demographics, mm -hmm. you could also maybe look at their current screening rates and trends, mm -hmm. and then I, I would want to look at screening rates. If you bump up screening rates, yeah. that would be an interesting <coughs> outcome. True, right. What we, I'm sorry. Yeah, so I think, you know, if you do have adjacent counties or adjacent cities where um, you have an intervention in one and not in the other, that certainly makes you happier than saying Alabama, Alabama versus Louisiana, right? Because it's yeah. pretty far. So there's um, a paper that um, looks at what happened when, in Pueblo, Colorado when they went to um, indoor smoking bans and versus um, Colorado Springs. Um, and so they're, which didn't have the same ban over the same time. So they're able to look at you know, counts of hospitalizations and they've got the pre and the post, right? And those, so those are neighboring cities. It makes you a little bit happier than sort of saying, you know, but on the other hand, when you look at what happens before, Pueblo has a way worse, um, way worse health than Colorado Springs even to start with. You see this big decline when they you know, ban smoking in bars, but you know, it's still a question of how, how comparable are those cities. So yes, it's always, that's always a tricky, a tricky thing to do. And it depends on sort of, for this, how much bleed over is there, right? So, you know, if you work in Shelby County, or if you live in Shelby County and work in Jefferson County, you're likely to see the, um, you know, whatever is out there if it's, if it's a Jefferson County intervention. So mm -hmm. among those counties, could you just match with the county that maybe not is the neighbor, but is within the state as well, like Northeast Alabama or just Southwest Alabama? Yeah, like baseline characteristics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one way to, to try and get at, to convince yourself that these are fairly similar. Okay. One last question. What if, what if um, just going back to the example I used where you look at Alabama versus the, the nation, and you know, everyone's instance is probably going down, mortality is going down, you know, nationally. But let's say, you know, in Alabama, I know it's a crude example, but in Alabama, the, the, the incidents drop by a factor of three in comparison to the, the change in nation. Can you make something out of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, okay. if, right. So what you're, that would be exactly what you'd be looking for for evidence of effectiveness. That, okay. yeah, everybody's going down, but Alabama's going down faster, and it's going down faster after we, um, we implement this intervention. I suppose you also want to be cautious of other national campaigns that are going on as well. Right, mm -hmm. right. Over. And then defining Alabama, Alabamians Okay. Yeah. 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 So it gets a little complicated, but um, it is interesting, right? So um, the project I'm working on now, which is like a rolling disaster of a project, it has been such a 
it has been a real education. So um, Alabama Medicaid several years ago decided that they were going to go to health homes, so they would have you know <coughs> care management, and that would then roll into having accountable care organizations for all of their Medicaid patients, who are uh, adults with Medicaid. Okay, this is so cool. Um, so Dr. Charrington, it's Dr. Charrington is the PI of this grant. Uh, so she wrote this grant and I helped her where we're gonna do this exact sort of thing, right? We're gonna do this, you know, what's, what's the change over time? We're gonna look at when this intervention rolls out um, and you know, thinking about who's our comparator group, right? And thinking about are other states going to be the same sorts of approaches and you know, trying to pick states that were demographically similar um, and you know had similar Medicaid programs were not but we're not going to change them um, so it's it's very but, so it's a tricky thing and then of course Alamo and Medicaid decided to not do any of these things <laughs> we keep going back to the NIH and saying well now Alamo and Medicaid's doing this and we're going to study this instead so far they keep buying it but we'll see um, it's that's been an interesting one but it is but it is trying to think through all these issues about you know what What's an effect we might be able to see, right? So, are people getting, if for diabetes care, are people getting more preventive care? That's one of our outcomes. Are people happier with their care? Um, you know, are we and are we seeing fewer hospitalizations, potentially preventable hospitalizations? Um, but but trying to figure out who that comparator is has been has been a challenge. At this point, we're kind of thinking um, we might sort of flip it and there are other states that have done these um, accountable care organizations and maybe see if we could be the the, the non-change group um, so that's that's one of the one of the approaches we're going for specific to your question one of the what do you think if you start if you increase um, screening in a population that's under screened what happens to your cancer incidence oh it increases yeah Right. So, you know, you're you. That's pretty. That's pretty common. That you know, if you increase screening in an underscreened population, your cancer incidence is going to go up. If you are, um, if your screening program is working, what would go down? Well, hopefully the mortality would go down. Mm -hmm. Or, or the the uh, stage of cancer would go down too. Yeah. So if you can get that information, I think that's that would also be helpful, okay. right? Because you want to get because hopefully you're getting more cancers earlier, so your stage goes down, your mortality goes down, but your incidence actually is probably going to go up at least at first. Anybody else want to have a question they want to run through? Hopefully that wasn't too painful for you. Oh no, that was good. <laughs> that was very helpful. Thanks. I'm thinking about doing a retrospective database study through the VA, one of the VA databases. Mm -hmm. I want to look at, so there was a study in mice showing that the non-DHP calcium channel blockers like verapamil and dotiazam, they are able to block the flu virus from entering cells. Okay. So would it be possible to do like a retrospective study comparing patients on verapamil and dotiazam to other patients with similar arrhythmias on different drugs to see if their rate of hospitalization for flu or death from flu was different. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so um, so what is your so your outcome is what? Hospitalization from flu or death from flu. Okay, so hospitalization from flu and de or death from flu. Um, so hospitalization from flu, I know you can get in VA. Yeah. Can you get death from flu in VA? I'm not sure. So I'd have to dig through, and or at least maybe people who were hospitalized for flu that died from flu. So that would be like a case of fatality? Kind yeah. Of thing. And again, you know, you might be a little concerned if you're looking about in VA, right? About this issue, like the same issue with the heart attacks, right? So if somebody is acutely ill from flu, are they going to go to VA or are they going to go to whatever's closest that the ambulance takes them to? See, so yeah, I don't know how to. Yeah. How I would sort that out. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, one thing might be to link to other data sources. So I know in the past you, they've been able to link to Medicare. Okay. So at least you get older, most of the older adults. 
That um, might be our biggest population there anyways. Right. Or if, I don't know to what extent, you know, VA is going to get the claims from other institutions. They might, since yeah, they're both I a healthcare they, provider and a payer. They might actually be tracking in ways that you can, you can follow. Okay. They're certainly going to take keep track of whether people are alive or dead, right? Because they want to know, yeah. should they keep paying benefits? Um, I don't know, to, but you're going to need to see if you can find mortality. Yeah, I don't know if overall mortality would be different enough to be worth measuring. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's an interesting question. OK, so that's your, so that's your outcomes. Your patient population, um, OK, and your exposure is verapamil and still ties in. OK. Or so what's your comparator? So I was going to, thinking about doing the other calcium channel blockers, so like amlodipine, they're mm -hmm. not used for the same thing, but I would have that as one of the comparator groups than other antiarrhythmics. So I'd probably use people with the same, same disease state and use those as the comparators. Okay, so you're gonna limit your population to people with arrhythmias. Okay, so you limit your population of people with arrhythmias, and then you have two drugs that are relatively similar in terms of the, the indication? Yes, so I'd have to find another antiarrhythmic that's not one of these calcium channel blockers that's used similarly. Right, and so that, what you're doing there is that sort of a design approach to deal with the confounding, right? Is that you're limiting your population, you're, you've got two you know, true treatments, so you're limiting your population to a, a group that has, is going to be using verapamil for arrhythmia and not for blood pressure control or something yeah. else. And then you're going to get another, you know, another therapy that's relatively similar. And that will, your compared group, and it reduces the amount of confounding, right, rather than just comparing verapamil to any other drug. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's, I think that sounds like a good idea. Okay. Um, what is your time frame? Sort of how long are you looking? I was thinking maybe one flu season. So I'd pick one of the flu seasons with the highest hospitalization rates and use that as the, the window. Did you do last year? Yeah, I was mm -hmm. thinking last year would be a good one. So you could do that. I mean, you could also expand it out and look at you know differences across flu seasons. That would be yeah. another way of doing it. Because you're if you're doing database work, you know, the the real investment is the coding. It doesn't really matter how much code you run, like how much data you run that code on. Um, so you could, you know, look at, you know, was last year's flu different than the year before? Okay. Yeah, I was, well, I was also wondering if, um, if you use more than one flu season, you know, it, it, it would be your sample size to make more likely to find a difference. Yeah, it's probably a good idea to use as much data as we can. I just don't know how accurate it is the further we go back. But I'm sure at least the last few years would be safe. Yeah. And VA's got a long, I mean, VA goes, has electronic medical records for longer than most systems. So yeah, we can go back pretty, I mean, 10 years, easily. Okay. I don't know, does anyone know, like, if, if you're really sick and you're a veteran, you go to the nearest hospital, it seems like a lot of veterans still end up at VAs. I, don't, I, mean, I feel like they still send them to the Birmingham VA. So uh, you, you might you might be able to mitigate some of that because um, you know they always oh I'm, I gotta go to the VA for my care so they, they may eventually get there. <laughs> Have to look into the numbers. Something that you might want to think about maybe even adjusting afterwards is um, if they get treated with Tamiflu, if that yeah. would. What about the background vaccination rate? If that's different between groups, that could yeah. mess up your results. That's a, yeah, that's yeah. A yeah. Good things to add. And people get vaccinated <laughs> at the pharmacy and that kind of thing, not necessarily at the. Well, that should go to the VA claims data. Could get that from my data. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, it, right, so it depends on the. $10 gift card and they want but to it's directly. <laughs> <laughs> Every year, you get up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, but it's going to depend on whether they build a VA, right? So if you're getting VA, you know, if you get, go to the VA for your care, but you go to the flu shot clinic right. where they just like line you up at UAB and like you get you everybody flu have, shot. Uh, if you're looking at MRs too, maybe yeah. immunization history, they should be 
documenting that every visit um, if they're admitted or something like that. Similar to UAB, you can just go to the MR and check. So is okay. So that's an interesting question, right? So with the EMRs, right? So you get is that going to be um, is that going to be structured data or unstructured data? I don't know. Uh, it's probably going to be in the note, right? So what's in the note versus what's in the claims makes it very different, right? So sure. in the, if it's in the note, there you can't do an automated query, right? Um, whereas you know you can just pull ICD nine codes right. or or ICD ten codes for others. Um, there are ways around that. So there's like natural language processing and other things that that sort of read those mm -hmm. notes. Um, mm -hmm. But it takes those take a lot of um, development. So if there's already there might already be um, natural language processing that tools that will tell you about you know whether someone was vaccinated because I know that in the VA in particular. The infectious disease group has done a lot of this natural language processing, so they build out these tools. But if they haven't, then it's a much harder question, and, and that goes into feasibility, right? So, what can you do is, in your time here, can you get this natural language processing tool up and running? Maybe. <laughs> well, that is a good suggestion. Okay, so that's that's the sort of those are the sorts of questions that you're gonna. Think about when you're thinking about your research question. Um, another thing to think about, and we talked about this a little bit, are what are the important confounders? You know, or what are the potential biases that are going to come into your into your study? For count confounders in particular, these are things that are strongly associated with your outcome and your exposure, right? And are not in the causal pathway. Those are those are the big confounders. Those are the things you worry about. And these are going to be things like demographics, comorbidities, health behaviors. Right? You will rarely get a study, like you'll rarely present results that are not at the minimum adjusted for um, age and sex. Right? Those are sort of the two things people generally want to see. But then also, you know, anything else. Right? So like, what was the indication for the medication? Um, you know, what was your po patient population? Those sorts of things. And then you start thinking about what's your study design. Um, so is this like a question of who and how many, right? Just kind of a counting question. Is this a question about why? Um, how frequent is your outcome? Can the exposure be measured after the outcome? Um, does prevalence tell you about incidence, right? So does saying how many people in the population now tell you about how many people are developing the disease? Um, how much time and money do you have and what's been done before? So some of these are obvious. I think the exposure measured after the outcome. So when I was in grad school, a friend of mine was um, doing research on lupus. And at the time, there was this whole raft of studies saying, showing that people with um, lupus had lower vitamin D levels in their blood than people without lupus. And she was like getting in, so therefore vitamin D protected against lupus. My friend is like losing her mind and getting madder and madder with each of these studies that comes out. So what's the problem with that study? Or what's a problem with that study in terms of exposure and outcome? Lupus patient does go to the sun. <laughs> right. Um, so people who with lupus are sun sensitive. Um, they can't go out in the sun. So and vitamin D is formed in the skin when you are out in the sun. Right. So you know those are that's a question where you know the exposure really can't be measured after the outcome to tell you anything about cause and effect, right? Because there you know that it's actually. The lupus, it's the disease itself that's causing the lower vitamin D. Um, does prevalence tell you about incidence? So, right, does the fact that San Francisco, so I think this is true, but I could be wrong about this, does the fact that San Francisco has a higher prevalence of HIV than Alabama and then Birmingham tell you that the incidence of HIV infection is higher? Right, so if San Francisco has a higher prevalence of H uh, people with HIV, living with HIV, than, than Birmingham, does that mean that the incidence of HIV is higher in San Francisco than in Birmingham? No, right? Because you've got the pre prevalence relates to both how many people are getting the disease and how many people are, are sort of what's the duration of that disease, right? So I think the incidence rates are higher. For HIV are higher here, but I think prevalence is higher in San Francisco because 
there was a higher incidence rate a long time ago, right? But that people are living for a very long time with that disease. So um, prevalence of conditions that are um, either you know short duration or are, because you know, people get better or they're short duration because people don't live very long with them, then the prevalence and the incidence sort of tell you something about the other. If there's a long duration and a variable duration, then, then you can't use how many people now have the disease as a proxy for how many people are getting the disease. Does that make sense? Okay. I do have a question on that. Mm -hmm. um, be, because I, I've, I've forgotten the difference. So incidence is people that get it, and then prevalence is everyone that has it in a particular population. So At a, at a particular point in time. Okay. What about the development of tools to measure a, a particular thing over time? Like I'm thinking of autism, mm -hmm. where there were always people with autism, and all of a sudden they got to the point where, oh, let's we need to screen for it and measure, and um, so it looks like it's skyrocketing, and all those people are developing autism, but it wasn't really the case. Right. So you've got some like diagnostic bias, like changes in the diagnostic criteria. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's going to also make it tricky, and it's going to you know make you know, studies of, first of all, things like who, how many, right? That's going to be confounded by time. Um, and it's going to make it hard to say, okay, if we did a study, you know, 10 years ago or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago, is that really the same thing that we're talking about now? Yeah. And those are, those are challenges and other things to think about. Yeah, so this is certainly not a <laughs> comprehensive list of things to think about. <laughs> Okay, so if we're just really thinking about who and how many, um, we can talk about surveillance. And so this is, you know, how many people have a disease? So, sorry, I, use my, I have my definitions here after my question. Um, prevalence, or how many people develop a disease for, for incidence? So um, there's a study, so I've got a couple examples for each of my study designs, and these are not a comprehensive list of study designs either, so I don't have the sort of difference in difference sort of policy example here. Um, so, looking at the Zika outbreak on the island of Yap, um, which is in Micronesia, so you can look at Zika antibody prevalence or Zika disease incidence, right? So, prevalence, you know, you sort of do a household survey and you say how many people have evidence that they have been infected at some point in the past. Incidence is looking at how many cases show up to the medi for, for medical care. Right? So, you can get a sample of households, get blood samples, so and interview about diseases with some symptoms similar to Zika. Um, and what they found was that 74% had evidence that they had at some point been infected. Of the people who had evidence that they had been infected, 38% had symptoms. And of the people without evidence of infection, 19% had symptoms. So what do you think is going on with this 19% of people who did not have antibodies having symptoms? Like acute, like if they haven't had the time to develop antibodies? Or they might be in a window period between their antibody development for change of class. Mm -hmm. Right, so they might not have developed the antibodies yet. So that's definitely one. Explanation. How many people like the, you know, the, um, false the, yeah, false negative. Really just had something that looked like Zika, so yeah. the blue. Right. Mm -hmm. right, so you, you can have, right, we like, it, we like biomarker tests because they look really objective, but they're not perfect, right? You can get false negatives. <coughs> the symptoms are not fully specific, right? Right. So you, you've got all these different potential things that have happened. Or people might have some sort of immune variant that means that they just didn't, you know, they didn't mount an IgM response, maybe. Um, for the incident surveillance, what they did was they went to um, the medical facilities on this island. So it's a small island. You get one hospital and four medical centers. So you get pretty comp pretty easy to go and do that med like hand medical record review where you know in the VA it would be much much harder um, you get uh, their suspected disease right so these are their symptom list and then the confirmed disease is the symptoms plus um, either antibodies or RNA 
And what they find is that they have 185 people who have what looks like clinically Zika. Um, 49 of them have strong evidence that they did have, that this was Zika. 58, 59 have probable, right? And this is the weaker antibody evidence. 72 never had tests and five tested negative, right? So again, these five testing negative, these are not very specific symptoms or the test didn't work very well. Either or both are possible. Right. So this is really telling you about, you know, when we're talking about surveillance, we're really talking about how many and who, not necessarily why. So as a sort of academic epidemiologist, I don't do much surveillance. This is more CDC, health department kind of, um, you know, hospital epidemiologists are, are more likely to do this kind of work. Less so people who are sort of research focused. So... When we start asking questions about why, one thing that we can do is an ecological study. And this is really sort of looking at populations. It's not really looking at people. So we're looking about at the correlation between the rates of disease and the rates or degree of exposure. We've got both the exposure and the outcome measured on the population level. So this is a famous one. This is the seven country study. And what you've got here is on the y-axis, you've got CHD deaths um, per 100. On the x-axis, we have percent calories from saturated fat. And each of these circles is a population. Right? So there are seven countries, more than seven circles, because several of the countries have, um, multiple, uh, have multiple populations within that country. So this is one of the first studies that was done to, look, to support the hypothesis that in pe or first human studies that were done to support the hypothesis that saturated fat causes heart disease. Um, there's this whole, like when I was looking for this picture, there's this whole conspiracy theory on the internet about the American Heart Association and like how they, but anyway, it's, it's sort of crazy. I was like, wow, I didn't, I had no idea. Um, there are certainly, I don't think it's a conspiracy, I'll start with. Um, there are certainly issues with this type of study, right? Because um, percent calories from saturated fat, that's actually coming from the agriculture departments of these different areas, right? So what they're looking at is not what are people eating. They're looking at what's being produced, what's being imported, and what's, you know, and and, and what's being exported. And from that, they're assuming that people eat the rest, right? So that might or might not be true, right? So um, we do know, though, that this. Let's see if I can. There we go. So this one is Eastern Finland. And so in that area, um, at that time, it was um, mostly logging. And so people would you know, go out, they'd pack these lunches that were you know, bread with butter and cheese. Right? So that was their, what people would have. Um, and so that was really a lot of saturated fat and it's very high death rate. And then, let's see. Okay. Whoops, wrong one. So then Western Finland, which is here, has a much lower, um, much lower saturated fatty acids, and those were that population was mostly fishing. So people were eating a lot less saturated fat. It's not super strong evidence, but it is interesting, right? It can be done using existing data. Um, but you've got the ecological fallacy that people having events might not actually be those who are exposed, right? So even though Eastern Finland, the the loggers were eating these very high saturated fat meals. Not everyone was a logger, and you don't know that, that all the events were happening among loggers. You also have these issues that, you know, percent of calories from saturated fat might be a marker, might actually be something else. So one of my um, professors in grad school had plotted bathtubs per capita uh, on the y-axis, or on the x-axis, and you got a pretty similar um, correlation coefficient. <laughs> Right. So again, this is sort of one of those correlation, not causation. I will say that there have been other studies that do, like saturate, you probably should not be eating um, cheese and <laughs> butter and bread for lunch every day. Um, the next sort of step up in terms of strength of evidence for in a sort of standard epidemiology study would be a cross-sectional study. At this time, it's sort of you're looking at the outcome and the exposure at the same time. Right? So you're looking at prevalent disease and prevalent exposure. 
so my, I gave, me, gave you my lupus example where this really falls apart. Um, there are other things where it's less of a problem, right? So if you're looking at, say, a genetic exposure, right? Your, your outcome does not change your, gene your genes, right? If you're looking at genes. It gets a little more complicated if you start looking at um, you know, epigenetics and those sorts of things, but you know, for genetics, probably as long as the disease is not, or the outcome is not rapidly fatal and your genetics aren't related to that, you can probably be pretty safe looking at cross-sectional studies. So this is uh, my example. Here's one that I did um, when I first came to UAB. Um, so we're looking at MIs that are not clinically recognized, and about 20% are actually not recognized. So what we did was take a population of people who had had an electrocardiogram, and they had a, a health interview, and we say, um, OK, so exclude all the people who told us they had heart disease. And then we look at the people who, on their ECG, have evidence of a past MI. Right? So we're looking, that's what our, we're calling unrecognized MI. And we're comparing it to people who said they had no heart disease but didn't have ECG problems. And we looked at a bunch of different exposures. Um, we're looking at age, past smoking, current smoking, self-reported diabetes, self-reported hypertension, and blood pressure. Right? So in this study, we're particularly interested in things that would be available to a clinician in a sort of primary care office visit. It's relatively simple logistically. right? It's quick. Um, but in this case, prevalence, I don't think my prevalence and incidence are unrelated, right? And the disease may, in some cases, change the exposure, like the lupus example. So when we think about how you people wind up in our study with unrecognized MI, first of all, they had to have an MI that caused a Q wave. Not all MIs do. The MI had to not be recognized for some reason. Either the person didn't realize they were having it, or the person realized it went to the, got healthcare and the healthcare didn't realize it was happening, or the person didn't, went and got healthcare and then didn't understand what they were told, right? And that does happen. Um, then they had to survive, right? They had to survive long enough to get into our study and actually volunteer to be in our study. And then their QAs had to persi persist, right? So all of these things go into who in our population had unrecognized MI. So that um, is a limit, you know, that's one of the things that you need to think about when you're doing a cross-sectional study. Certainly not trying to discourage you, but you know, those are those are considerations for interpretation. Cohort studies, again, are, are a little bit stronger, again, than the cross-sectional study, because what you do is instead of taking people who have exposure now and disease now, you say, okay, I want to identify people who don't have my disease but are at risk of it. And you can follow up to see whether the exposed groups are more likely to develop disease or develop the disease more quickly. Right? So in this way, you can sort of, you, you at least, at least you know that your exposure happened before your outcome. So that's, that's always a good thing when you're trying to make a causal inference. So for this example, um, this is looking at alcohol intake, so self-reported alcohol intake. So you have a big population, 38,000 men. Um, they completed questionnaires about drinking habits in 1986, and then they're followed um, for have you had a heart attack, right? And if people don't return the questionnaire, they start looking to see if people had died. Um, here, all of these men in the study are health professionals, and the reason they chose health professionals is because they thought that people would be able to actually answer the question, have you had a heart attack, and answer it relatively, um, relatively accurately. Um, we look at rate of heart disease by alcohol drinking and by types of alcohol beverages consumed. So here, right, again, you have these sort of relative risk graphs, and everything's kind of on top of each other, um, which is part of the point, right? Because you hear in the um, late press that, oh, you should be drinking red wine, right? Uh, most of the studies actually show that whatever you're drinking, it's the same. It's probably the ethanol and not the other stuff. That's in the, in the alcohol. And you see this um, decrease. Now, there's a lot of controversy about this. Um, there are some biochemical suggestions that this is real. It 
does not, but you're also getting increases of cancer as we go on. And you have very few people who are really drinking 50 grams of ethanol per day. Um, and most people who are drinking a lot are either not in the study because most people do not, because most people who drink a lot do not volunteer for these studies, or they're lying, right? So with a grain of salt, but moderate drinking is associated with, and consistently associated, and plausibly causally associated with lower risk of MI. What about, uh, are you, said like this, aren't, how concerning about like recall bias, like, oh yeah, you know, they only had three beers, but they wrote down they had five, or vice versa. Right. Like that too. Social desirability type bias. So you get some like non-differential because what this question says is over the past year, how often do you, do you usually drink mm -hmm. beer, wine, liquor? And the options are like never uh, less than once per month, once per month, like two, th three times per month, once per week, you know, and etc. Goes up to like maybe nine times per day. Um, because well, I should say that the questionnaires are for like they ask you for. All the, everything, so it's always the same scale. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you have some sort of just like people don't remember. Um, you have some social desirability bias, and that's the people who are drinking a lot are probably not telling you. Um, for alcohol, actually, it's probably better than other things that people consume because people tend to remember. They tend to remember it and they tend to do it, it tends to be very habitual, right? So like people who always have a glass of wine on Friday always have a glass of wine on Friday. Um, or, you know, if you have one drink, one glass of wine with your dinner or one beer with your dinner. Um, so people tend to be able to recall that better um, than, than other things because they're also asking about like, how many times do you eat apples? I don't know, I mean like, right, I think people are, those, I think, have a much worse recall bias right. than, than beer or wine or liquor. Mm -hmm. So, but yes, that is, that is definitely something you worry about. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so we get temporal ordering. Um, we get incident disease, right? So those are both real advantages of cohort study. But it takes a long time and requires a lot of follow-up of a lot of people, right? And so the, the less common your disease, the more people and the longer time frame you need, right? So if you were MI, unfortunately, is still relatively common. Um, but if you were looking at glioblastoma, right? You can't, like that is a much rarer disease and it would take a very long time and a very, long pop very large population. So in that case, we'll often do a case control study. So here we identify cases of the disease and identify control group without disease and compare their exposure history. So it's basically like, um, so you, you, know, you could go in and in this, my example, you've got um, the outcome being persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. Right? So this is sort of a, a problem with how the fetal circulation adapts to non-fetal circulation. And um, the, it's a case control study, so I identified 377 infants and their mothers. Um, and then as their, so those are their cases, as their control group, they have 836 infants and mothers without PPHN. And they were interviewed about exposure to SSRIs during pregnancy. So again, here you have issues of recall bias, you have issues of social desirability bias. This study was actually really carefully defined, uh, designed so that the interviewers don't know what the hypothesis is. And they're very closely trained and monitored, so there's, they try and not, they're asked in such a way that it doesn't trigger social desirability, but you know, try and trigger people to answer in one way or another. But you do really worry that women who, are, who have a child who is you know, in the NICU are gonna answer differently than women who are you have a, a child who is healthy. So one of the things for this study that they did was they looked at when the SSRI use was. So they say, okay, before week 20 or after week 20. Biologically, they thought that after week 20 was the sort of key period. And because you see an association after week 20 but not before, 
give some reassurance that this might be real and not just a bias, um, because you know most women in the study are not going to know like what, what the what the critical period would be for this particular exposure and outcome. That being said, um, the, this is still pretty controversial, and there's a bunch of studies that come up with different answers for this for whether SSRIs cause PPHM. And so these studies are efficient when the outcome is rare. Right? So if you have a rare disease, this is probably what you want to go for. Um, but you do worry because the exposure is usually measured after the outcome. So the, if the outcome changes the exposure or the report of the exposure, you can get run into some biases. So finishing up, um, like I said, this is just very surface. And I was getting waved at by Eve, so I sped up a little bit there at the end. Um, so there are a bunch of books out there. Um, I really like this Epidemiology and, Inter and Introduction book. Um, the public health or Principles of Epidemiology and Public Health Practice is great because it's free online. Um, and it's put, put out by the CDC. The Finder of PICO, um, this, this group didn't um, develop these criteria, but I think that this is a, a really nice paper that goes through sort of how, how to think about these. Um, there is, similar to CONSORT, if you're familiar with clinical trials, there's a um, reporting guidelines called STROPE for epidemiology. Um, and they're less sort of structured than the CONSORT because epidemiology is less structured than clinical trials for the most part. Um, but this is helpful for thinking about how do you report and how do you, and secondarily, how do you design studies or how do you evaluate studies. And finally, CCTS. So I think. I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, but um, we do have uh, drop-in clinics, seminars, webinars, one-on-one -on -one cons consultation. Um, this is, I think uh, Dr. Redden said the same about the biostats, but I can help some when, if, once you've already collected your data, but it's easier and probably more productive to start at the beginning. And uh, contact information, happy to chat with people. So thank you very much for attending and participating. <laughs> Any questions? Would you be willing to go back to the, um, the CDC? Um, yes. Uh, and we could send out these slides if that's helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Comment here. Thank you. Oh, just. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>